strengthen us, encourage our hearts, and, and bless us through it, we do ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's uh, turn uh, to our Bibles, uh, to the book of Romans. Once again, we are in Romans. If you are visiting with, you, with us this morning, we sure appreciate it. Uh, we have been studying uh, Paul's book, to uh, his letter to the Romans. Uh, he has never been in the city of Rome. Uh, he's wanting to be there and then not only to minister to the word to him, but then to move on from there to Spain. But at this time, he is just writing a letter to them, and it's a wonderful letter because we in the church has been so have been blessed by this uh, epistle. Imagine if we did not have the epistle of Paul to the Romans in our Bibles. We would be greatly impoverished, wouldn't we? And so we thank God for this, for the Apostle Paul and for this marvelous book. Uh, this morning we are in chapter 5, uh, chapter 5, and we, our focus will be on verses 6 through 11, but Let's begin our reading with verse 1. And if you were able, would you please stand as we read God's holy word. Romans chapter 5, where Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we are reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Blessed are all those who hear and who embrace it by faith. You may be seated. Paul has started this chapter with the word, therefore. And as I indicated uh, last week, uh, when... Paul uses this word, therefore, he wants us to understand that what he is going to teach is based on what he has already taught, therefore. And so uh, in chapter 5, the word therefore ought to direct us back, at least in our minds, to chapter 4 where Paul has taught extensively on the great doctrine of justification by faith. There in chapter 4, he tells us that just like Father Abraham, who believed God and was therefore justified, so we who believe in the promise of God in Jesus Christ, we too will be justified. Um, Paul uh, brings out, uh, brings us back to the Old Testament scriptures, to Genesis chapter 15, where the scriptures say, Abram believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. 
But Paul tells us that these words counted to him as righteousness were not written for his sake alone. They were not written for Abraham's sake alone. But he says to us in chapter 4, verse 30, uh, 23, but also for us. So that if we believe in him who raised Christ from the dead, we too shall be justified. We too shall be counted as righteous. The moment we believe, Paul says, is the moment when we have passed from death to life and all things are new. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And on the basis of that reality, a whole new world opens up for us. And that's what Paul is describing in chapter 5. He says, on the basis of this new reality, since we have been justified by faith, we have all of these rich and marvelous blessings in Christ Jesus. And so he starts listing them off. In chapter 5, verse 1, we have peace with God. We now live in the new realm of grace of God. And then he says we have this hope of the glory of God. And not even suffering, not even suffering can shake our confidence in the hope of the glory of God because we know suffering is the way to glory. And in fact, suffering enhances our hope, enlarges our hope for that glory. And that hope, Paul assures us, does, will not put us to shame. It will never disappoint us. And here's why, verse 5, because God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. What tremendous blessings and benefits for those who are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Now beginning with verse 6 then through verse 11, Paul is substantiating what he has just said to make it even more certain, to convince us all the more that the assurance that we have of the Father's love for us, which has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, is firmly anchored in what happened in time and space in the death of Jesus Christ. He wants us to understand that the love of God has objectively, visibly, publicly been revealed at the cross of Calvary. You see, he is concerned that we should realize more fully what it means that we are certain of the hope of the glory of God. Of God. And so this morning I'd like for us to look at verses 6 through 11. These are wonderful verses. They're all wonderful verses. Every time I come to a new paragraph, a new section, I think these are the most wonderful words in all of the book. But this is a great book, but, and this here is a very, very good section. And I hope uh, that you will be encouraged and that your faith will be strengthened, and the assurance of God's love will be all the greater in your own heart and experience. I'd like us to organize our thoughts around these three phrases. You don't even need to write them down if you're inclined to. It's this, Christ died, why Christ died, and then thirdly, since Christ died. Christ died, why Christ died, and since Christ died. First then, Christ died. In verse 6, 
Paul says, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now we understand just from reading that verse that the, the, the emphasis is on this notion that Christ died. But the structure of this verse in the original is actually quite unusual. If we translate this verse literally, which happens to be one of the shortest verses in the whole book of Romans, Paul actually, if you read it in the original, it goes on and on and on and on. But this is actually one of the shortest. And it goes like this. For Christ, comma, while we were weak, comma, at the right time, comma, for the ungodly, comma, he died. Isn't that interesting? Christ, he died. And then in the middle, all three modifiers focus on Christ's death. And this is Paul's main point. Christ died. And this emphasis on death is carried on in the next number of verses as well. Each of the next number of verses end with the verb to die. So, for instance... Um, Verse 7 reads, Scarcely on behalf of a righteous man would one die, though perhaps for a good man one might dare to die. Verse 8, But God proves his own love for us while we were still sinners, Christ for us died. So when you look at it in the way that Paul actually structured it, you see this emphasis on died, 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 died. And you get the point. Paul wants to underscore. He didn't have highlighters and and, uh, italicies and so forth. But he uses words. And the words is died, 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 died. And you get the point. Paul wants us to understand that Christ died. And the central point uh, that Christ died is then carried over into verses 9 and 10 as well. In verse 9, through the words, by his blood. And in verse 10, by the death of his son. You know, Paul wants us to understand this is the great wonder of the gospel. That Christ died. And really, this is what's uh, underscored, highlighted in all of the four Gospels, isn't it? They all end on this note that Christ died. They all communicate this fact in one way or another that Christ came into this world so that he might go to the cross to die. You see, that's why the Gospels are not biographies. They're not just nice little history lessons about the the history of Christ. A couple of them don't even mention his birth. But they all focus, they all move, and they spend a considerable time on his suffering and death. Christ died, Paul says. And here he says, Christ died while we were still weak at the right time for the ungodly. Now it seems like Paul is picking up on the metaphor of childbirth. I actually meant to read with you Hosea 13. I'll get to it in a moment. But um, he's going to speak about childbirth once again in chapter 8, where you might, rem- you write, might know that um, he speaks of the whole creation groaning um, together in the pains of childbirth. And then he says, and not only creation, but we ourselves also groan inwardly. So in chapter 8, Paul is speaking of the anticipation of that final day when we'll be fully redeemed as the people of God. There is suffering now in this age, and so we groan along with creation, but we do so in anticipation of that final redemption 
or that final reality, the redemption of our bodies. But here in chapter 5, Paul is using this metaphor to speak of our lack of desire for this birth and our inability to give birth. Now, in Hosea um, chapter 13, the prophet presents a picture of Israel as a woman experiencing labor pains that signal the birth of a child. Listen to these words. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin, Ephraim is another way of the prophet speaking about Israel. The iniquity, the sin of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is kept in store. Here it is. The pangs of childbirth come for him but he is an unwise son, for at the right time he does not present himself at the opening of the womb. Now, did you hear that? At the right time he does not present himself at the opening of the womb. Birth represents deliverance, the opportunity to be born to new life. But Israel... Hosea says, Israel's like a foolish child who refuses to be born. Now, what would happen if, if at the right time, on the due day, the child refuses to come out? Well, of course, only death. You see, uh, the child would die, and that was Israel. Israel, Hosea says, was piling up sin for years and years, and the punishment of that sin was now about to come upon them in a form of national destruction. And the right time has come. The opportunity to be born to new life presents itself to Israel. There is hope of salvation if the nation responds in repentance and faith but it stubbornly refuses to. It's far too comfortable in its own sin. Israel loves her sin, and at the right time, Israel has no desire to move from that position, even though it spells death. And Hosea says, that's foolish. But it gets worse, actually, because in 2 Kings chapter 19, we are told about the invasion of the Assyrians and how King Sennacherib has already destroyed the kingdom of Israel, bringing fulfillment to Hosea's uh, prophecy of chapter 13. But then he um, went on to besiege the city of Jerusalem. And Hezekiah was the king of Jerusalem at that time. And when he gets the news, he sends word to the prophet Isaiah. And he says this, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of distress, of rebuke, and of disgrace. Children have come to the point of birth. And there is no strength to bring them forth. The time has come. The baby is ready, but there is no strength to deliver. That's the picture of Judah without strength to help themselves against the enemy. And once again, it spells death. So that's the picture of 2 Kings chapter 19, and that's the picture then that Paul takes over here in Romans chapter 5 verse 6. For Christ, while we were still weak, at the right time, for the ungodly, he died. Do you see Paul's point? Christ came at the right time. When the world had no time for him. He came to the world and the world was not ready to, for him. He came to his own and the own, his own did not receive him. The right time was when we were weak and without strength to help ourselves. 
The right time was when we were ungodly, loving our sins and no desire to be saved. When the right time presented itself, we were foolish and loved our sin and would not even think about salvation. And just at that right time, Paul says, Christ died. The picture is crystal clear, isn't it? Christ did not die for Christians. Christ did not die for good people. Christ did not die for those who were desirous for salvation. Christ died for the ungodly, Paul says. Those who love their sin so much that they happily choose death and judgment over life. And what's more, they could not do anything to help themselves. They were without strength, without ability, without power. And not only did they not, could they not give birth to life, they had no desire, no inclination either. Like foolish, the foolish son that Hosea speaks about, refusing to present himself at the opening of the womb at the right time, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the truth of God for a lie and, 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 and worshipped the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Does that sound familiar? It should, especially if you've been following our study in the book of Romans. Because um, it's a description of Romans chapter 1, verse 18 and following. That's where we get the description of the ungodly. The ungodly, those who, who, who know God but who refused to acknowledge God as God and to thank Him and to worship Him. And therefore, they start living a life of unrighteousness. This is the ungodly. And Paul tells us it's, it, it's the ungodly that He reveals His wrath. That's how verse 18 begins. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against the ungodly. And now listen to what Paul says in chapter 5. Christ died for the ungodly. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Paul has already hinted in chapter 4 when he said, God justifies the ungodly. Remember, he spoke about the faith of Abraham. Abraham believed, and then he says, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. And now, Paul spells it right out. God justifies the ungodly because Christ died for the ungodly. This is what he said. He didn't die for good people. He didn't die for lovely people. He died for the ungodly. And if you're a Christian, then you know better than anyone else that this is absolutely true. You know, this is what causes your heart to expand with love and, and, and um, adoration. And sometimes your eyes to swell with drops of tears. Sometimes I'm saying because you're Presbyterians and there's not often that kind of emotion. But sometimes there is. I see it from the pulpit. You're overwhelmed with God's love to you in Christ that you tear up. And you do so because you know this to be true. That Christ saved a wretch like you. When Paul speaks about the ungodly, those who are with, uh, without strength, those who are weak, he's not speaking about somebody out there. 
although that's true. But he's speaking about you, and you know it. He's speaking about me, and I know it. Just at the right time, you see, Christ died. Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love. How can it be? that thou, my God, should die for me. That's it. That's the, my first point. Christ died. But then secondly, why Christ died? And when we think about that, I guess there are a number of ways we could really respond, right? Why did Christ die? And you could say, um, well, Christ died for the consequences of our sin. And that would be right. Christ died to bring us to God. Christ died to bear the wrath of God for us um, and therefore to save us from the wrath to come. Christ died to bring us life so that we would not die. Uh, Christ died so that we, we might be reconciled to God. And all of these, of course, are true and correct. But the particular focus that the Apostle Paul has in this text, his particular concern is to communicate not so much the necessity of salvation and therefore the effects of Christ's death, but, get this, the love of God that ever devised such a great salvation. The love of God which ever so uh, which whichever devise such a salvation. So why did Christ die? And Paul says in verse 8, so that God could prove or to demonstrate his love for us. Now notice how Paul puts it there in verse 8. But God shows his love for us. How? By Christ dying so God shows his love. The word there is actually stronger. He proves to us his love. How? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see the emphasis. God the Father proves his love for us. The us, sinners, how? By Christ dying for us. You see, what Paul wants to underscore here, uh, underscore here is that the love of the Father for you. He wants to convince you of the Father's love. And that Father's love is not just word, it's action. It's action. That's what love is, even in a marriage, isn't it? It's not this sentimental stuff, you know, that comes and goes with your mood or circumstances. No, it's action. And here it is. God demonstrates, he proves his love for you, Paul says, in the death of his son on the cross. It's the Father's love for you. That's important to underscore, because, and especially in our time. There's this notion in the Christian church that when we think of God the Father, the three persons of the Trinity, but when we think of the Father, we thoughts of his wrath come to mind. Uh, an angry father, you know, a father who, 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 who hates sin and therefore is angry with sin. When we think of the Son, we think of the love of Jesus Christ. And often there's this notion in the evangelical church that it's the Son, God the Son, Jesus Christ, convincing his Father to show love to the sinner. And he did that by giving his life on the cross. And he says, see, Father, we can do this. But that contradicts everything that Paul is saying here. And it really marginalizes and distorts the person of the Father. Paul says it's the Father. There is actually emphasis, but God himself shows his love for us. 
God shows, God, God the Father shows his love for us. The love that he had for you from all of eternity, the love that he had for you in time, Paul says, is now proved in the giving of his son at Calvary's cross. Paul will go on later to say, it was the father who did not withhold his one and only son from the cross because of his love for sinners. Our salvation is the result of the eternal love of God the Father for sinners. And to magnify the love of the Father and the uniqueness of the love, the wonder of this love, Paul presents an argument from the lesser to the greater. Look with me in verse 7. He says, um, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. So Paul's saying it would be uh, it would take a very loving person to die in the place of another person. One would scarcely, hardly die for a righteous person. It's extremely rare, Paul says, extremely rare that anybody would die in the place of another who is upright. Though perhaps it, it might happen, there might be a possibility if that person was a good person. But, and here's what's absolutely amazing. We were neither good. We were neither righteous. We were ungodly. We were without strength. We were sinners. And then he'll go on to say in verse 10, we were enemies. And it's for those for whom God offered his son to the cross, the death of the cross. That's love, you see. That's amazing love. God loves us. Not because we are lovely. God loves us not because we are righteous. God loves us not because we are good. He loves us while we are sinners. The point Paul is saying to us and teaching us is, is that he loves you because he loves you. That's why. When you ask the question, why does God love me? Why does God love me? He just does. He just loves you. There's no reason in you. There's reason in God. He loves you. The heart of God loves you. And that love for you is demonstrated supremely so at the cross of Calvary. You see, it's at the cross that God the Father has proved his love for you. Now, this is, this is very important to to think on, to reflect on. The measure of God's love for you is not your feelings. It's not based on your emotions. Now remember in verse 5, if you were here last week, Paul tells us that we know God's love. Why? Because of the experience of that love that has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. But here's the point. What if your experience of his love diminishes? What if you're going through such trials and you're being tested and you have doubts? You see, our experience is not a good gauge to understand the depth and the uniqueness, the, the, the overwhelming extent of God's love. The cross is. 
The cross is the objective reality of God's love. Your feelings might prompt you because of circumstances to question it and to wonder if, in fact, he loves me. When you're going through trials, then what? And the Father says to you, he says, my child, my child, look to the cross. Look to the cross. There I publicly and visibly displayed, put on display my love for you in the giving of my only son for you. Do you see? Paul wants us to know objectively and beyond all doubt that God the Father loves you. The depth of the Father's love. Oh, how deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one brings many sons to glory. That's the father's love for you. There it is. So Christ died. Why Christ died? And then thirdly, since Christ died. Look with me at verse 9. Since. There's where I got my clue for my third point. Since. You see, in, in, when you read Paul's letters, this is just a parenthesis. Look for these connecting words. Like verse 1 of chapter 5, therefore. And then verse 6, for. And now verse 9, since. And so you, you need to be on the ball. You, Paul wants you to be thinking. Remember, it's through the renewing of our mind that our lives are transformed. And so, and, and he's, he's speaking in the context of suffering. It was Abram's life. That's the pilgrim's life. That's Christ's life. And that's the Christian's life. Through much affliction, you'll enter the kingdom of God. And so Paul wants us to be thinking when, when our feelings aren't carrying us, it's when our feelings, our emotions are not making the day for us, what do we do? Well, Paul is saying, think this through. Think this through, dear Christian. You've been justified. Now look at all the benefits that are yours. Even if you don't feel them, it's true of you. And Paul says, now, listen, Christ died. God showed his love in Christ's death for you. And now, look at since Christ died, since we, therefore, we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved from, by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. What Paul is at pains to communicate to you is that your salvation is as secure as it will ever be when you place your faith in Jesus Christ. Since you have been justified by faith. This is how secure it is. It can't be, it, 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 it can never be diminished. He wants to assure you of the certainty of your hope that he who started a good work in you is the one who will keep you in that grace, in the arena of grace, through the rest of your life to the final day. And he wants you to think this through. If you ever doubt, if you're ever tempted to think that his grace will not support you, listen to these arguments and let them settle comfortably in your heart and mind. He says, if you have already, if you have already been saved, having been justified by his blood, verse 9, 
It's absolutely inconceivable that he will not save you literally from the wrath. That's his point. It's inconceivable. If you have already been saved by his blood when you believed in Jesus Christ by faith, it's inconceivable that you will not be saved in the end from the wrath that is to come. And then verse 10, if Jesus Christ went to the cross and died in your place, when, listen, when you were God's enemy, if you were saved while you were his enemy, listen, this is you. If you were saved, if he saved you while he was your enemy, how much more now will he save you now that you are his friend? Do you, see, do you see his argument? If he did this for you when you hated him, when you were hostile to him, would he ever, ever fail us now that we are his friend? You see, if he did not give up on you, <laughs> when you were at war with him, what could you do to make him give up on you now that you're his friend, now that you are reconciled to him? What could you do? Think about it. What could you do? Think. Think for a moment. What could you do? Could you do something? Maybe you can't think of anything, but I'll tell you someone who does and who can. It's the devil. He'll think up a lot of things. He'll think about it. You say you've been reconciled. Why are you still sinning? Why are you still sinning? And, 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 and uh, how about those sins of long ago? Those sins that nobody knows about. And, and how about those that, that bosom sin? that you love. I know that you ask for forgiveness, but you've done that before. And, and you've done it again last week, but you keep on going back. How about those sins? Will they somehow disqualify you from the love of God in Jesus Christ? And how about... How about your lack of devotion for Jesus? The other week, I was right there, and there was this perfect opportunity for you to speak about your Jesus who saved you, and you lost the opportunity. I knew that you were struggling with it. I knew that in your conscience, you knew that you should say something, and yet you let it pass by. Do you really think that you are a child of the living God and that he loves you and that your salvation is secure in him? Do you see? And I was at your home the other day. You sure didn't act like a husband to your wife. I was at your home and you sure didn't act like a child, a Christian child honoring his father and his mother. I was right there. What, what do you mean? You're a Christian. You see, and the devil will think up all of these things for us, if, even if we can't, and he'll parade them before you. But you tell him, this is the logic. This is, this is practical theology. Paul says, you tell him, thank you, Satan, because some of those sins... I've already confessed and they've been forgiven. And if I confess my sin before God, he is willing and able to forgive me and cleanse me from all righteousness. And thank you, Satan, because you did remind me of some sins that I have not confessed and I need to confess them too. But I'm going to do this because I know my God is, is a merciful God. And yes, I know I keep going back to the sin even though I hate it so much. But by God's grace, I will defeat it because greater is he who is in me than in the world.
Satan, you just don't get the gospel. My salvation, the security, the confidence that I have in my salvation lies not in me, but in my dear Jesus Christ. My salvation is not based on my performance, but solely on God's precious grace. It's since Christ is the one who died and achieved my salvation through his death, Paul says, how much more will he keep me safe now that he's alive? Do you see? Do you understand the logic of the gospel? We need to think these things through. Otherwise, we'll be well dislodged. Not mobile, not able to speak forth the praises of the God who saved us because our conscience are riddled with guilt, just like the devil would want them to be. But you see, Paul wants us to understand that there is nothing in all this world, or for that matter, in the world to come, as he'll go on to say in chapter 8, that will ever be, that will that will, that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Nothing will be able to separate. Absolutely nothing. Do you see? And this is what we need to understand. Since Christ died, we are his now. And we have all the assurance that we will be saved from, from the wrath. We will be saved to the very end. We are his friends. We are reconciled. And there is no turning back. There is no reverse. You know, if, if, if well, I, I won't even go there. Well, yes, I will go. It's this, since our lives are hid in Christ, because by faith we believe in Christ, our lives are hid in him, we are united to him in faith. For you to be rejected at the end of this age is for God to take Christ and to send him into hell for all of eternity. Do you think that's possible? Therefore, my dear loved ones, your salvation in Christ is secure. And that's why we have this confidence, this assurance. And the Spirit is our witness. He assures us. He pours God's love into us. Day and day through troubles, through trials, through sufferings, through this present pilgrimage to glory, He assures us that nothing, nothing can ever separate us. Christ died, you see, just at the right time for us. Christ died to prove the magnitude of the Father's love for us. And since Christ died and opened heaven's door for us, there is not even a remote possibility that he will not ensure we will enter through those doors. And that's why, look how Paul ends this passage, verse 8. That's why we rejoice in God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You, see, you know another thing, we could spend another half hour on this word now. Now. Now, now the, the, this, this is how the passage begins in verse 5. Since we have been justified by faith. That's the now. It's past tense, so now we live in light. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, at the end, more than that, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Reconciliation is what? Peace 
with God through Jesus Christ. You see, it comes together. Paul's arms comes around the whole passage and he says, in other words, this is for you, Christian. This is the present for you. This is your reality. Now that you have been justified by faith in Jesus Christ, this is for you. And this is why we rejoice. We rejoice. More than that, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's actually, you know, it's interesting. And that's the word boast again. So in verse 2, uh, Paul said, we boast in the hope of the glory of God, in our ultimate destiny. Verse 3, more than that, we boast in our suffering. And now verse 11, Paul says, more than that, we boast in, <laughs> in God. We rejoice in God. You see, at the end of the day, it's all from God. <laughs> And that's why we rejoice in God, because our salvation is all of God through Jesus Christ. And our eternity, our hope, the hope that we have of, 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 of glory is all of God. And so we boast, we rejoice in that God of our salvation. Isn't that awesome? And you know, that's the great mark of the Christian. That is the mark of the Christian because this boasting, this, this rejoicing is the mark of a justified person. It's unique only to the Christian faith. There's nothing else out there because, you see, it's not contingent. This boasting, this, this, this rejoicing, this deep, settled joy is not contingent on your circumstances or on your performance, but on the Father's love for you in Jesus Christ. And therefore, it does not change. And if you're not a Christian, you don't have this. You really don't. You look for it, but it's not there, it's fleeting. And then you look for something else and it's there. And then at the end of the day, if you have the resources, you just despair. But to be a Christian, isn't it great to be a Christian? Every time I'm finished with something like this, like it, it's great to be a Christian. But if you're not a Christian, don't you want to become a Christian? Don't you want this peace for your guilty conscience? Don't you want rest? Rest in a restless world. You're looking for things. You're looking for rest. You're looking for peace in and, and all the wrong places. And you still look and just to have rest. Don't you want this knowledge that your sins are forgiven? This sense of belonging? Don't you want this, this settled assurance that when you die and you will die? This is the, one of the great things about COVID. It gives us an awareness that our life will end. We will die. Don't you want this assurance, this cast iron certainty that when you die, there will be a home for you in glory. Don't you long for that? And Paul says, believe in him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and this and more will be yours now in the present and for all of eternity. <laughs> this is the gospel. Thank you for your word. Oh, Lord, comfort us through it. Stir our hearts. Help us to be so overwhelmed by your love that we'll increasingly hate our sin. Help us to be so affected by the magnitude of your love that we will correspond to disgusted with anything that is contrary to that love. Flood our hearts with joy 
this morning as we leave this place. And during those moments, those times when we suffer, oh Lord, may these words come back to our minds and may they then flood our souls with the knowledge, the truth, that indeed you, a loving Father, has loved us with an everlasting love in Christ Jesus. And it's in his name we pray, amen. amen. Well, let's um, respond with that lovely hymn, 455. 455, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's love? Died he for me. Number 455, let's stand as we sing.